Oh gosh, these sessions are going so well. We are again, super happy to have you all here and delighted that Mr. Mike Van Tegum is with us. Uh, as James said, if you wanna leave your camera on, that's just fine with us. The bandwidth seems to be working out well. Just turn off your microphones for now until we get to the Q and A. Again, the reminder, this call is being recorded and will be on our YouTube channel tomorrow morning for viewing. Um, I'll put the link in our social media channels for that as well. The Talent Optimization Program has generously uh, collaborated with us on this series and is providing some sponsorship for our uh, presenters, which is awesome. And next week's session is going to be a collaboration of all of the presenters. And it's, I did the graphics for it today, and it looks a little bit like a dodgy boy band, but I think it's going to be awesome. Um, anyway, we will have a Q&A after the session. Over to you, Carmen. All right. Hey, thanks, Beth. And uh, yeah, everybody, uh, welcome back to our five-part coach development uh, webinar entitled uh, Preparing for the New Normal. Up until now, we've uh, focused on the speed and power events and uh, have discussed the challenges of uh, training when um, access to indoor facilities has been slim to none uh, due to COVID. In fact, uh, here in Alberta, the uh, Butter Dome, uh, which was this time last year, home of the U Sport Championships, is uh, now being a, uh, used as a field hospital. But also uh, the challenge of training outside. It's been uh, super cold for the speed and power athletes, especially during that uh, polar vortex. So, uh, oh, even my, my colleagues in Toronto, get this, not only do they not have access to indoor facilities, it's too cold to train outside. So a bunch of those athletes decided to train in an empty parking garage on campus and they got kicked out that uh, they weren't allowed to train there anymore either. But anyway, tonight we're gonna look at the opposite end of the track and field spectrum and check in to see what's been going on with the distance runners to find out if they've been challenged by anything. And uh, the talk is called uh, Ready, Ready to Race. And our guest speaker is the one and only Mike Van Tega. Now, Mike was born and raised in Calgary, and uh, most of you know him as Athletics Alberta's endurance guru, uh, not only because he's been named to uh, numerous Canadian national teams, most recently the Rio Olympics and the uh, 2019 Pan American Championships, but he's also coached numerous athletes that made it to the national team level, including Olympic Jessica O'Connell and for those of you that were watching the athletes webinar just now she was hosting that uh, and also Maria Bernard Galia uh, and both of those athletes are also from uh, uh, Calgary so yeah that's how most people know Mike uh, me on the other hand well <laughs> I know Mike from his BC days back in the 1980s uh, not so much because of his coaching greatness in fact, I didn't even know he was a coach. All I knew is he's the guy that married my friend, Brenda Barbieri. And at the time, or prior to that, Brenda was the head coach of the Kamloops Track and Field Club. But then Mike came into the picture. And next thing you know, uh, Brenda's moving down to Kelowna. However, together, they were a strong force. Not only did they were they the founders of the Kelowna Track and Field Club, but they also spearheaded the Jack Brow Memorial Meet. Now, this wasn't just another run-of-the-mill track meet. I mean, this was a premier event that uh, all the clubs in BC uh, flocked to. It was uh, held at the Apple Bowl. It was the either at the end of June or the beginning of July, right around that time when summer was starting. And uh, clubs from the Lower Mainland, from Vancouver Island, from um, uh, no uh, Northern BC, Prince George, Smithers, you name it, uh, teams from Alberta and all across Western Canada. I mean, it was the place to come to. Uh, people came for the track meet, but stayed for the festive atmosphere just because uh, Mike and Brenda's did such a good job promoting the event and running a real top-notch track meet. So uh, yeah, it was, it was the place to be. But in addition to uh, building a solid track and field program, uh, being the host of a top-notch uh, track meet, uh, Mike also created this feeder system for kids who went on to collegiate greatness. Uh, he didn't, it was just, just this atmosphere that, that he built up. So for example, athletes like Brenda Shackleton and uh, Tanya Jones, uh, they went on to uh, UVic. Uh, Dan Bertoya and uh, Mark Bompa, they went to uh, Simon Fraser. At UBC, we had Phil Ellis and uh, Karen Doubles. Karen wasn't a distance runner, but she was a, a top-notch uh, uh, hurdler. 
And uh, then this other gal, uh, Melinda Elmore, she went to some small school down in uh, California. I think they call it Stanford. And, and she did quite well there too. Uh, not only was she a five-time All-American, but word has it she is still the school record holder for the 800 and the 1500. And as most people know, just recently last year, she broke the Canadian record in the marathon. So, uh, so that's pretty exciting stuff. Anyway, after uh, several years of being in Kelowna and doing such an outstanding job, uh, Mike and Brenda uh, moved to uh, Calgary. Uh, Mike's mom was getting on in age and needed some support, so they did the right thing and came back to, uh, to help out with her. And when, uh, when they were back, uh, he was coaching with the Calgary Thunderbolts, as well as the UCAC, the University of Calgary Athletic Club, and they both coached with the, uh, Calgary, or the University of Calgary Dinos. Um, one of the many things that I admire about Mike is that although he has been the personal coach of three Olympians, his focus has always been on identifying and meeting the needs of every athlete that he's coached, regardless of their ability level. And another cool thing about Mike is that he has coached athletes uh, across all age groups, from the JDs to the, to the school kids, up to uh, uh, national junior team members, national senior team members, and then, like I said, all the way up to the Olympics. So he's, uh, he's definitely well-versed in coaching a variety of athletes of, of all levels. Um, and, and although uh, Mike and uh, Brenda recently retired and moved back to BC, Mike is still very much a part of Athletics Alberta as he continues to be one of our lead coach developers, both as a learning facilitator and a coach evaluator. And uh, having said that, it is my great pleasure to welcome Mike to our webinar this evening because I, for one, want to know uh, what's going on with these distant dudes and why are they so ready to run and race? Over to you, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Carmen, and really appreciate uh, what Athletics Alberta has done in, in putting this uh, this together. Uh, it's been, a, I think it's been a great series and uh, it motivated uh, Jessica to get some athlete equality in there and get one going for the athletes. So it's had probably some unexpected spinoffs, but I think it's just been really, really great. And I certainly enjoyed uh, listening to uh, Larry and Les um, earlier and caught up with the, the triple jumper a while ago, just check them out with uh, the recorded version of it. So uh, it's been really good. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful to to be here tonight. And just looking at the time, I noticed with the other guys, Carmen, you had, you know, you guys did your setup and great background. And I, I couldn't fact check a lot of what you said about Les and Larry, but I can for me. And uh, I just won't go there. I'll just take what you said at face value and hope everyone else believes it too. But thank you very much. <laughs> also in the fact that now I'm down to uh, <clears throat> 50 minutes. So that's good. Because uh, I know that when I was talking to Maria and Jess about doing this, and they were, you know, trying to get clear on what what the point of it was and what I was doing, and and one of them I can't remember which they said, you know, so what you're doing is basically, uh, you know, talk about you know coaching, competing after COVID, and I said, yeah, Carmen said she wanted me to basically tell everything I knew about coaching distance, and the other one I don't name names because I'm not sure, and they're both pretty lippy said, all you know about coaching distance and how much time do you have? And I said, well, I think probably after the intros, 50 minutes. And he said, oh, man, well, what are you going to do for the other 45 minutes? So um, we're into the minutes now, so I, I guess we'll get going. So this COVID thing, if we could get the, the slides up. Uh, at first, <clears throat> what I found is being, being old and retired and living in the sleepy town of Summerland, I didn't really notice many changes in, in my life once once COVID came along. Uh, you know, most of my time would be out, you know, running, sort of, cross country skiing, golf, yard work. You know, sort of that. I was a lifestyle social distancer, anyways. Like it was just basically what I did. Um, but as a coach, well, that soon became another story. Uh, it's um, once it sort of a apply the reality that COVID brought to us on its daily changes, it became, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, couldn't travel when you have athletes in another province, that's, that's an issue, uh, stressful, some anxiety producing, I guess. Um, but I basically, you know, that to get to a point where really, uh, as I said, it didn't, it didn't really impact me day to day until, you know, the, the coaching part came in. So we can do the next slide. Here we go. 
And as I said, initially it wasn't a big deal. You know, I'd started social distancing before it was a thing. It wasn't like I liked time on my own. I needed it. Um, I think as a runner, although this didn't happen very much unless it was two meters ahead, having two meters between me and the next person, that wasn't a problem. And um, I think Jessica pointed out, you know, if you run with a mask on, that's like hypoxic training. So it's like a poor man's altitude. So that's a good thing, right? Uh, not really. Actually, I, I ran this little line past Trent Stillingworth and he corrected me right away saying, actually, you won't get hypoxic with a mask, but, but I know you're kidding. Next slide. So like I said, as a coach, I, I had to sort of practice what I preach, I guess, and say, look and saying, this is what I say to my athletes. This is what I'm going to have to say to me. You can only really start from where you are. So this view from outer space, here's Earth, you are here. So here's the beginning. And next slide, please. And normally, the way I looked at it is that normally we sort of start off by looking at a target meet or a date or a range and then plan our, our training uh, working backwards to current day. And I think for another way of looking at it is given the COVID influence training limits and restraints, what we maybe need to do is put less emphasis on where you've got to be by a certain date, but really look at where am I today and then how do we progress safely from where we are today? Because simply to put in a you know date and saying that, you know, Olympic trials are this day and I'm going to work back and, you know, this is what I'm going to do without, you know, looking at things like, well, if my athletes leave the country, they quarantine for 14 days or they're not allowed to use the Olympic Oval or if they do use the Oval, they've got to wear a mask or, um, you know, the, the gyms are shut down, the pools are shut down. So we really need to look at what's, where are we today and what can I do step by step from today? Next slide. So I think this is a, probably the first big step is in making a transition to post-COVID racing, I think was the, the term that uh, Athletics Alberta gave me for this. So first of all, I think as a coach, you need to know more than any other time, perhaps, what, what is the training your athletes been doing prior to returning to you? Sort of what's been going, have they been able to train? To what extent have they been able to train? Because you know, a lot of groups just haven't been able to meet. Um, so in this way, what you can do is plan your best transition for them. So consider things like, you know, what are the surfaces they've been on? What are the surfaces you're going to be using? Uh, what are types of training have they been doing? Um, to what, you know, what level of intensity, et cetera? And make sure you're moving from that. So you can't, I think we can't go in there with a preconceived notion that uh, we're all on the same page, because in a lot of cases, uh, we're not even reading the same book. So uh, we need to I think we really need to look at that. So the more I think we know what we're moving from, um, the better able we're gonna to be to plan uh, what we're planning towards. Okay, next one. So this little slide actually, is, I, I mentioned, I was talking to Trent Sillingworth about um, the physiologist and you know about this in general. And he said, you know, he's always, every time you're talking, you know, there's a great study done on. So, and, and here's this great study. Uh, it's actually, um, I noticed that, in the first presentation, it was a reference to, to football as well. So this is interesting. The year of the NFL strike, uh, they they had several years of data um, in Achilles injuries, and so you look at the the rate on the top, which is a you know over that I think seven period seven year period, and you see five different injuries. But the year of the strike, um, basically they couldn't do preseason training. They couldn't do their conditioning. Uh, so, um, you know, so they couldn't do their, their rookie camps. They couldn't basically couldn't do a lot of buildup. So a lot of what we would call, you know, our general prep, they didn't do, but they had to put their season on. So they basically threw it into preseason and boom, look what happens to Achilles injuries. So if we just treat it as business as usual uh, and say, you know, this is pick a date, um, let's say this is May 1st, here's what I always do on May 1st, we're probably setting ourselves up for, you know, some pretty big disasters. Next slide, please. I think one of the things, um, <clears throat> there's a number of things I think I could do, especially since I've, I know for sure I've got less on here and one or two other power speed people. You know, I had to, had to bite my lip when comments and, and, and even Carmen, when you said, you know, that it was cold outside for sprinters. I, I don't think that distance winners go out and it's magically warmer for them. Um, and I think Raylene had a good question on saying, you know, can you sprint when it's cold? Okay, well, I, 
pretty sure the answer was no. Uh, you can run, but it's not going to be sprinting. But I think one thing about distance runners is they don't generally need to be motivated to run or to run fast or to run more. Um, a lot of times it's a matter of putting on the brakes. And I think if we've had people that have been held back because of COVID, haven't been able to see their friends, haven't been able to train, and now we're coming out and we're training and are looking ahead to meet, uh, then we need to be aware of that too, that maybe our job might be more of hanging on to the reins rather than sticking a grizzly bear on them. Next one. So I think the, the steps, you know, that, that I look at, and, and what I did here really is um, a lot of this kind of developed it uh, based on how the process I'd follow if I've got an athlete returning from injury. And one of the downsides of having been a coach for 40 years, I hate to say that number out loud, uh, is that you've dealt, you know, dealt with a lot of injury, dealt with a lot of return to running protocols. I remember back in the early 80s getting hold of Lynn, uh, Lynn Kanuka's article on pool training and thinking, wow, this is something, you know, here she comes back from a femoral stress fracture and a few weeks later runs a Canadian 5K record. So, um, Basically, it's something you, you know we've had to apply. So, the model that that I'd sort of preach would be first: let's look at being consistent. So that we're training consistently. That we're out doing whatever we're doing consistently. It could be walk, run, or walking to run. Uh, it could be easy running, but we've got to first get that going. Then add volume. Then increase intensity. Certainly not. Again, let's use that May first model and say, well, May first, twenty nineteen. This is what we always do. Uh, we can't just apply it to May first, twenty twenty one. So specifically, maybe being aware of a percentage of high intensity to overall training volume. So you, you don't want to see that, uh, you know, what you're doing that's, that's really intense is a significant percentage of your overall volume. And also looking at a given workout. So it may not seem like a whole lot, but if that's a high percentage of the athlete's overall weekly training volume, then that's going to be a problem. So if they're running, you know, 20K a week, and you give them 10 times 400, well, they've just done a, a huge percentage of their weekly volume uh, at a very intense level. And they're not going to deal with that too well, at least not too well uh, for too long. Another way of looking at it is the percentage of the weekly volume uh, at threshold pace or faster doesn't get over about 15 or 20%. I think once we get into to that kind of ratio, um, we're setting, you know, we're setting ourselves up for some potential problems. Next one, please. I just wanted to put this here to clarifying terms because distance people use the word tempo and uh, it's, it can mean 101 different things. It's, uh, so I, the, the example I use, it's an athlete uh, will go unnamed in an era I'll leave unmentioned and hopefully um, no one will connect any dots here. Uh, we're getting ready to head out for a tempo run and I heard this particular athlete sort of expounding on the fact and saying, well, everyone knows tempo is just your 5k pace. And I thought, uh, I can't let that go. We're going to have to have a discussion here. So I said, well, come here. So what you just said, let's talk about that. So what's your best 5k? Uh, 15 something. Okay. And you're going for a 20 minute tempo run. How is that going to work? You're going to go through 5k in 15 minutes, your best, and then you're going to do that for another five minutes, not likely. So it's like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. Well, the, the point I guess I want to make is that we've all got sort of defin different definitions of it. So tempo is a type of anaerobic threshold run. So I think when we talk about the run, like a tempo run, um, we, we throw that word in there, it sort of becomes interchangeable. So when I'm talking about aerobic anaerobic threshold, looking at, you know, using a couple of sort of um, measures that, that people can use is, you know, approximately 30 seconds per K slower than your 5K pace, or a more wordy definition of moderately hard pace an athlete can hold for eight to half marathon. Course depends on fitness. I, I remember telling athletes at one time that, you know, your tempo pace should be about your half marathon pace. But if I'm talking to 14 and 15 year olds, I don't want them going out and running a half marathon to find out, oh, gee, what's that pace? So we, we need to find a way that basically um, that that we're working um, at, at anaerobic threshold. In, in the case of someone like Jessica or Maria, they can get, they can get tested. We can know exactly what that is. Um, but, but I found just, you know, from watching them training over a period of time that going down to Victoria one time for, for testing, I know that uh, I 
said, you know, it's probably going to be about 330 a kilometer and at sea level, it was 327 or something. So that was, you know, just from knowing your athlete and watching, I think you can, you can develop that pretty much yourself too. And um, when I'm talking VO2 max or aerobic power, I'm talking about the same kind of idea and that's kind of your three to five K pace one-to-one -one work rest ratio. So when I'm using that in these next few pages, that's that's what I'm, I'm looking at. And since I do have a poli-sci degree and then a counseling degree, as well as education, and there's no real science in there, and contrary to you know popular belief, political science is not really a science, uh, apparently. So um, I don't, I don't want to have to get into a physiological argument or have to bring my wife down here and uh, she knows stuff. So anyways, I think the first step is looking at how are we going to phase in quality? So if we're going to race, we're going to have to start to increase our quality. So these again are some of the things that I've done where you know I've had athletes coming back from injury. So maybe what first do from easy runs and you know just steady pace kind of runs, um, bringing in maybe saying, let's do some uh, anaerobic threshold miles. So if you've, you've read Dr. Daniel's stuff and you talk about cruise miles, so doing these at your anaerobic threshold, maybe doing them by the mile, you know, with 90 seconds rest. And with younger athletes, I find it's a one, it's a way to learn how to run tempo or the tempo pace or anaerobic threshold pace. Uh, and it's also a way to break it down and make it make it easier. Um, we actually in Calgary had used uh, Canmore Park, which is 1700 meters. So it's kind of a long mile, um, but we found if we had the university athletes going doing a temple run, it would be the classic, you know, starting off fast and dying and, the, and you weren't running at a regular, you know, one regular pace. So uh, Doug and I sort of worked out, well, let's do, let's do it a lap at a time and give them 90 seconds rest and, and really focus, get them to get a feel for uh, what that pace is and then maintaining it. Um, another thing we could look at is saying, okay, from easy running, introducing these anaerobic threshold or these tempo pieces, and then build to what your full tempo run desired would be. So, and these are just suggestions. So just your breakdowns of that, that I sort of see as a progression. So it might be four or five minute pieces uh, with 90 seconds to two minutes in between. And after that, you know, doing that a couple of times, maybe going to three by eight minutes then two by 12 and then building to 20 minute continuous. So and the 20 minute continuous is obviously it's shorter than three by eight and two by 12. I'm not good at math, but I can do that. Um, but doing the continuous piece is gonna be tougher than doing the broken pieces, obviously. Uh, another thing that we've used is lead the workout off with a anaerobic threshold piece, then add some quicker parts afterwards. So uh, maybe doing a 10 minute tempo, um, taking a short break and then doing some pieces of, you know, two or three or four 200s or 300s or 400s. And I put Jess in the corner there with a little light bulb over her head, uh, not just because I thought it looked cute, but um, which it does. But also because she pointed out um, the, I, being here and her and Maria being there, uh, she was watching Maria's workout and this was actually one Maria was doing. And, she's, and I had it set up as the 10 minute tempo, three by 400, three by 300, three by 200, thinking, you know, everybody loves a breakdown workout and it's just going to get easier. Uh, but as she pointed out, and she's got a master's in uh, Kines and she's run a few laps in her time. She said, you know, starting off, you know, with the 400, it's, it's, it's pretty tough to, to just do that whole 400 at all of a sudden going down to you know, a 1500 or 3000 pace. So, you know, might be an idea to start with a shorter one and then, and then go to the 400. So I thought, you know, that's really good observation and it makes a lot of sense. So um, my coach's brain was thinking, if they start with the 200s, they're gonna go too fast. Um, so that's why I thought the 400, but I think, I think she had a very valid point. So the, the bottom line with this is we want to go from the easy steady running to, to building in quality and, um, starting with not too much quality, especially from the longer end. And that's where I, my first step is always trying to come in with that um, anaerobic threshold piece. Uh, the last thing, yeah, the other thing with the, the last one with the 10 minute tempo first, it does take a little bit of the, the starch out so that um, the athlete isn't likely to go out, you know, and hammer crazy right once they hit the, the track on the shorter stuff. Next one. Uh, so another one, a sample that we could use as a mixture of uh, anaerobic threshold work with some VO2 max work. So for example, um, doing this threshold mile, uh, taking two to three minutes break, and then doing, for example, uh, three by 300 with a minute, taking that set break again. It's not, and it's not a, you know, the thing is the threshold mile isn't, isn't gonna 
shouldn't wear the person out if it, if it does, they're not doing it at threshold. Um, and what I focus is saying, doing that at a nice smooth control pace, then getting on the track a little quicker turnover and then back out to the mile and um, back to the threes and could be fours, uh, could be four of them, doesn't the numbers you can play with. Uh, but what I found is that the anaerobic threshold piece really helps to clear out the lactic during the workout. And as I mentioned with the previous slide, it's, it helps to hold the athlete back from doing the shorter pieces too intensely too, I think. Um, you could use twos, threes, or fours. I think a shorter pieces, depending on the age or ability of the athlete. Uh, when I'm doing this initially, it's just to get turnover going. And again, it's phasing that in. It's introducing it. Um, you could also use things like three to six minutes for your anaerobic threshold piece, again, depending on the age or ability of the athlete. So you don't have to, um, you know, it doesn't, you, again, like a lot of times in track, we see a track, well, it's 400 meters, so let's do multiples of that. Or uh, it, we can use time on the track too. We can use off distances. Uh, it's, you know, we're not limited by the fact that this is how they built the track. Uh, okay, next one. So if we go from the other end up, uh, and this is something that I, I'm pretty sure Les mentioned, I'm pretty sure Larry mentioned it, um, speed is something that, that you need to stay on top of all year. Uh, and I know you might be, they might be thinking, <laughs> distance guy, what do they know about speed? Uh, well, speed's a relative thing to me. Uh, so basically we're talking about, you know, working on speed here, your, your strides being, uh, maintaining your leg turnover throughout the season. Okay, that's one way. They're not, you know, athletes trying to think of that as sometimes they say, oh, we're doing 400s at speed work or we're doing 200s. So again, we get sort of caught up in these, um, little uh, boxes of, of thinking. So I think the key here is we wanna maintain leg turnover throughout the season. We can do that with strides every workout in and out on pre and post wherever we, we think they fit best for what we're doing that day. Um, so from the strides you normally have the athletes, you can increase the quality work simply from building from the shorter end up. If they're doing 50 meter strides and you can build to 80, you can build to hundred. So you can focus on saying, let's take that 50 meter speed that you're doing here uh, maybe it's your 1500 meter pace. Let's do it for 80 meters. Let's do it for 100 meters. Uh, and even building up to 200. So what you're doing is from that short end, you're you're working on speed. You're not pounding them too much. You're not making like really anaerobic demands on them, uh, but you are gradually building up some speed from that end. Uh, so you know, for example, if you're doing 50 meters at about nine seconds for 100 to the 100 at 17, maybe the 200 about 33. And I just they're getting a little bit quicker because you're not starting over again for each one. You're, you've got some speed you're maintaining right, right through. Um, so from the other end, I said with the longer distance repeats where you're going from easy running, introducing that threshold kind of work, um, you can also start to bring that down in speed. So five of those cruise miles, so five of those anaerobic threshold miles uh, with a minute 30 recovery, you know, might gradually involved to maybe five by a kilometer at five kilometer pace with three minute recovery. So you're not just gonna jump into 5K pace right away, but you can work down towards it. Or like I showed in the previous slide, you can fit it into the workout between some of those, those thresholds. So, you know, like I said, just for example, it looks at about 330 kilometer pace for miles, about 8K volume. And you're bringing that down to about, in this person's case, 305 a kilometer pace for a kilometer. Uh, for 5k volume. So uh, different workouts, no doubt, uh, but basically thinking of transitioning from one down to the other rather than just jumping into that first one saying, I've got to get out there and run 1525 for 5k because it's not going to happen right away. Our next one, spikes. I, I mean, we had a dollar for every time you've had somebody say, can we wear spikes? Can we put our spikes on now? You know, it could be two feet of snow. Let's put our spikes on. It could be a road workout. Can we put spikes on? Okay, maybe not that. Uh, but I think the general rule, gradually phase in the use of them. Um, maybe start with putting them on while doing strides and then increase the volume of the number of strides that they're doing. Um, introducing in your longer intervals, maybe in the last one or two reps, uh, then maybe in a final set. But basically being conscious of how much time are they, have they been in spikes? And how much have I got them in it now? Where am I going with this? So where am I at a given time? Um, you could even look at how many meters of volume per week if you're you know, on the track that they're, um, that they're wearing the spikes. So some way of, of keeping track of how much of this new modality am I, am I using here? Uh, just a note here, I mean, 
I think we, we know that doing these hard intervals at race pace are, are really, they are a good training stimulus, they're a necessary one, but they're also the highest injury risk of training that, that we can do. So, uh, you know, we've got to be, you know, we've got to be aware of that. Uh, next one. Um, this is a big one, I think, trying to avoid too much too soon. And we, we can't rely on the athlete in this one to, to give us the best feedback on what's too much and what's too soon. Uh, they want to do everything right now. Uh, I really think that one of the coach's biggest roles is, is bringing objectivity to the equation. Um, athletes tend to lack that, I guess is a good way to put it. Uh, so that's on us to say, how do we, you know, how do we do this? So one way might be uh, just rather than saying we're doing these intervals, uh, let's say it's going to be a fart lick session on the track. So I, I know I use 200s because I know a lot of distance people, I see 200s and they think, oh, 800 pace. I go, yeah, can I put my spikes on? Let's get going. Maybe we're not quite ready for that. Um, and this this is one I remember uh, talking with Doug Lamont one day and he was sort of wrestling with this where these kids were just going out and hammering when they got 200s. And so he came up, he said, he'd come across this somewhere and said, you know, what if we're going to do 30, have them do 30 seconds strong and then 90 seconds easy. And essentially the same thing, your same goal. But since we're doing them in the oval, nobody knew where they were. I mean, it, the, the math you had to do to figure out what your 200 split was, was uh, phenomenal and nothing against university athletes, but they typically use calculators to figure out their splits, which drove me crazy. So you knew if they're doing 30 seconds on, 90 seconds easy, um, they may not know exactly where 200 is. So that, that wasn't a bad thing. But just to, to get that sort of away from that mindset, of, it's gotta be this 200. Because one great thing about track is it's so measurable. Uh, it's also one of the bad things about it. It's so measurable and, and athletes measure. Um, I was talking with, Jessica once about just using a, a Garmin and the fact that, you know, we become slaves to that, that watch. So you put it on and you know that you run and it records it and it's going to go up on something, especially if say you're on Strava, then right away, even though people aren't supposed to judge, then they're judging and you're judging yourself. You think, oh, I just put up like six minute a kilometer pace. That's terrible. You know, I, it's, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to run way faster next time and get injured. That's a good idea. So, so I think that's one of the things here is is um, by just taking that, distracting a little bit away from a, a measurable number that, um, you know, that might be a negative kind of reinforcement. Um, also with this one, um, someone made the comment here that uh, uh, Dennis Farrell really loved doing 250s with Mel Bishop where, you know, and he's, again, he liked a little bit more for strength, but again, it just wasn't as calculable into an 800 split. So um, same kind of idea. Okay, next one. And I wanted to just put in a few other ideas in terms of some sample fart licks that might sort of get a way of bringing in some quality, but again, getting away from, uh, um, you know, hard measured track distances. So the 39, as they said, uh, maybe doing a descending ladder of 90 seconds, 60 seconds, 30, then 15. So getting quicker as you go, uh, your recovery can be what the next quick part is. So if you run 90, you rest 60, run 60, rest 30, run 30. Um, uh, it could be one-to-one -one as well if you wanted to. Um, the 60, 40, 30, 20, same kind of idea. A lot of these I used to call five-minute runs in Kelowna, and then every so often somebody in the season would do the math and say, that doesn't even add up to five minutes, but uh, whatever, we call them five-minute runs anyways. Um, the last one, 40, 30, 20, 20, 30, 40, it's, um, it's, it can be a little lactic producing because you've only got 20 seconds recovery. Uh, I think I've got time. So one little story on this one I had, um, Carmen mentioned Tanya Jones. So she, I think it'd been her first year at UVic and uh, it was still back in the day in Calgary, we had this amazing thing called the Calgary Stampede Mile. So got to run a road mile down the length of the Calgary Stampede Parade with like 50,000 people cheering. It was the best thing. Um, so the guys had some money, so they wanted to bring in some female athletes. So I brought um, Tanya. And so after she ran the next day, we were up at Glenmore and I was just going to have her run in the grass. And I said, we'll do a few of these. Um, I'll do three or four of these just in the grass in um, where you go. And I had an 800 run at the time and I was going to send him with her. And he's doing the math going 40, 30, 20, 20, 30, 40. He says, isn't that kind of like 300, 200, 100, 200, 300? And I said, well, kind of. He's like, I want a 150 guy. So he said, well, can I do mine on the track? He also didn't like cross country or grass. And so we had a little discussion and I said, you know, it's not the same thing. Went my rationale against my better judgment. I said, okay, go ahead. So 
he did three, two, one, one, two, three, and he was about um, thirty-five point um, twenty-six-ish, I think, um, eleven point eleven point, and then twenty-six-ish, and then that was it. Uh, we were done. Uh, 20 seconds rest was not enough for him to do that. And then Tanya came in and she'd done four sets and he just beside himself. How did you do four sets? I couldn't even do one. Totally different workout. Uh, but the, I wasn't successful in convincing of that. So that's a career failure right there. Uh, the Mona Fartlicks, another one from stolen from uh, one of Steve Monaghetti's workout. So uh, I think he usually says about a 20 minute tempo or anaerobic threshold to start with. Uh, so I modified it a bit and called it 10. And then basically and it's a series of kind of um, aerobic power sessions, 90 on, 90 off times four, 60 on, 60 off, 30 on, 30 off, and then 15s on and off. So uh, you know, again, it's a good way of you do the little tempo piece, um, take a little bit of starch out and then really focus on that one-to-one -one work rest ratio. And really just nice, efficient, smooth running, not you're not running to any different distant line or anything like that. You're simply going for the time. Okay, our next one. Um, now, I think once we phase into that and we've done the, the workouts and the training, people are going to want to race. And I think one of the things that we've got to be aware of that people have been away from racing for a while. They're going to be kind of anxious about it. So they're, they're going to want to have some kind of indication of where they're at. And, and you know, sometimes, you know, workout can give you a pretty good indicator. I mean, I think we've all as coaches have got our kind of indi indicator workouts. Uh, but another option is running maybe a shorter than distance uh, time trial. So a 3K runner doing, you know, 2K, 1500 runner doing a K. So you can take a look at that and get a lot of information on it and say, you know, you know, where were they struggling? Were they struggling in that at all? Where were the weaknesses? What do you need to work on? Um, since you really haven't raced and you haven't raced a full distance, they're be ready to come back to, you know, their next plane, um, training, uh, workout more quickly than sooner than if they had raced for sure. And, and I think this is the big one, as I said, that idea of that anxiety that they haven't raced. And I, I was having, um, one of my athletes was going to be a 3k time trial. And I just realized over listening to the feedback I was getting in the week leading up to it, it was, it was causing a lot of anxiety. And I realized, you know, we've had this COVID thing, we haven't raced. Uh, I'm suggesting, you know, 3k on a track surface. Um, you know, maybe I need to listen to what's going on here and take a look at it. So if we go to the next page, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is this is what I did. Is I did a broken time trial, so we did. So we're not ready to do 3K right out. I thought physically that person definitely was ready to do it, um, but it, it wasn't the right time for them. So what we did is basically took 2,000 at the target pace, and then you know easy jog, light strides in between. You want to stay activated. You want to just sort of sit around. Um, then we broke it down. So a 600 and then two fours and three twos. So we got 4K of pretty high, but really controlled quality and um, a confident athlete out the other side of it. Like, you know, they did better in the 2K than they thought. And then once they got past the 2K, well, six, four, four and three twos. Phew, well, I can do that in my sleep. Bang, away we go. And um, result was, you know, not overtaxed, um, good feedback, good result and something we could build on. Next one. So I think the other thing, if we're going back to racing, and you may have kids that come out, I think I just crossed my mind the other day, you're gonna have kids that have gone through a school year where they haven't done track. And so a lot of where we typically recruit kids from, we haven't seen them. Um, so getting kids into racing or kids that have been away from racing, especially younger kids, even remembering what they're supposed to be doing. So one thing I'd encourage you to think about is you can simulate race situations in your practice elements. One, it maximizes your time use. And the other thing, you can bring these, these elements to practice, make them a little bit more interesting. Uh, and certainly something for those people that have raced, haven't raced since I said, maybe, you know, February of last year, like indoors. So, you know, doing your strides, maybe start them at the 800 start or the 15 or the three and do the stride from the start. You know, if it's a hundred meters and, you know, the 800, they're running the corner, the 1500, they're running straight away. Um, you can even reinforce, you know, what do you want that start to look like? What should it feel like? Where should you be? A mid race, if you're doing uh, some of that anaerobic threshold work or you're doing specific race pace work, you can have, you know, make sure that the group does stick together, you know, at a given pace. So get used to some pack running. Um, tactics. So this mystery kicker, uh, the Legion camp was in Calgary in 1987. Um, 
probably, I don't know if the first time I was there or not, but uh, we were putting on the distant camp and one of the coaches had this little drill where he'd tell somebody in the group, the group had to run together, but he'd tell one person that um, they were the kicker. So they got to take off. Everyone was instructed they had to run the same pace um, and that somewhere between these two pylons, someone was going to take off. No one could go until that kicker went. And so it, it, was, it was fun to watch. It's fun to see the, uh, the, the mind process and the little games going as they're running along, looking at each other, checking each other out. And then when the kid went, boom, there, away we go. Um, I modified it a bit and put in a, a mystery pace setter too, so, or identified the pace setter and saying, so-and-so is the pace setter, nobody passes them. That's their job, you stay behind. And then I'd say to them, you know, you can go fast, you can go slow, you can do all kinds of things. They're gonna stay behind you. And then you could always debrief it afterwards. So it was kind of fun. Um, race finish. So if you're doing acceleration, you can do them, you know, from 100 out, 150 out, 200 out, um, you know, into the finish. So again, saying the same thing. We want you shifting gears smoothly. Uh, think about the process. Think about where you are. Think about what that feels like. Think about what the finish feels like. So again, things that you can process with them and then apply to when they do race. Okay, next one. Next slide. Sorry. Uh, mentally, uh, we really need to think about this. If I'm saying as a coach that I'm getting a little bit anxious about all of this stuff that's going on, um, we know that the athletes are. So uh, if they've been away for that extended period of time, then like I said, race simulations or practicing certain elements in practice, uh, doing predictor workouts saying, hey, you know, you've done this pace, you know, you can do that, uh, doing time trials and, and helping them see connection between previous workouts and performances. Um, Sometimes it's tougher when you've got developing athletes from year to year, they, you know, they, they progress just because they're physically getting stronger. Um, but, you know, with the more mature athletes can help them to say, you know, that workout, you know, they're beating themselves about, you know, that workout wasn't so bad because we did that back here and three weeks later, four weeks later, you did this. So again, helping them connect the dots, uh, is, I think is really important. Our next one. Uh, so competition, and this is a tough one, and I've been, I've been pounding my head against the wall over the last few weeks on this one, because just trying to sort out plans. I mean, we've got plans A to Z, and everyone's contingent on, you know, you go to the States, well, you got 14 days of quarantine when you come back. Now, how's that going to work? Where is it going to work? Is it a good idea? Um, Maria's going to be racing in Victoria next two weeks from now, um, and she's got to have a negative COVID test five days after being in BC. Well, right away that you've got to do things that you don't normally do. So uh, fortunately she's going to train here for a while before we go down there, but we, we've got to look at these things that it's just, just competing. It's, it's not easy anymore. But if you are returning to competing on a provincial level, pretty much everyone's on the same sort of level field. So I think that's, that's probably not as, as big a challenge. Uh, I think I would encourage that early competitions should maybe be an extension of practices. So again, building in those time trials or however you want to do it. Um, if there aren't national championships, and right now I don't know of really any, uh, the Olympic trials, or I don't even know if they're technically called the Canadian championship, but I mean, obviously as a the trials are pretty significant, uh, but there won't be U20. And I think the Legion just announced there won't be a Legion national. So, so if there isn't, then that's significant. And, and think in your planning, how does that impact it? So set your competition schedule and your season goals accordingly. You know, if that, that are the equation, now what does my year look like? You know, again, every other year, maybe I've, my goal has been to get, you know, my athletes to lead to nationals. If it isn't, okay, what am I going to do differently? What can I do differently? Next one. Um, beyond provincial, I think for some of us, there's that, that reality. Um, you know, if you're competing nationally, internationally, at some point I say, you have to decide when uh, you're going to have to roll the dice and compete. And, um, and, and again, coming back to the fact you can really only control the moment you're in. Uh, you've got to train a day at a time, but you've got to train as if these trials uh, and the Olympics will occur. And, but also remain open to options and ready for changing circumstances. I've got email strings a mile long with, you know, with BC coaches and some American coaches and, um, and, and they're all sort of permutations and combinations of, you know, if, if we go this route and do, you know, go to, to this meet in this place, what does this mean? And that's, let's work that through. What other ones does that, if I go to the States, what, what needs does that take out of the equation? Um, if, 
you know, really, it, it's it's a really challenging time, I think, for coaches to plan this. And I, I'm really grateful in BC. There's about five or six of us that are communicating on this and and trying to get uh, trying to come up with with a plan or a series of plans. And um, hopefully, we work this all out. Our next one. Uh, steeple I'll put in. Um, so again, similar, I think, to introducing the spike idea. I think um, there's some similarities here too. So if you been doing mobility drills, maintain them. If not, you want to introduce those mobility drills first of all. Um, you know, just the, the body movement, the trail leg, the leg over the hurdles, then introducing one or two, one to two to three, four to hurdles at different distances, then move to longer inter intervals into the full workout. And one of the things, you know, that I'm conscious of doing is being aware of the number of contacts and hurdles. So like uh, jumpers, I think probably use contacts. Um, so adding these numbers gradually. I had a discussion with Maria the other day because we put in um, what looked like to be a really light workout and it's sort of curveball at her. And I said, you know, we're introducing a new training modality. You're, she was doing 10, 200 meters hurt with two hurdles. Um, and I said, anything, you know, we, we've done some hurdles up to them, but we haven't done that. So we're introducing this thing. I've got to back off on, on volume. And we've got to focus on, you know, on the, the technical aspect of it. And you can't do that if you're, if you're tired. So, um, and we need you to recover from this and be ready for your next workout. So uh, being really aware of it when there's that technical piece in there is important. Our next one. So I guess last, almost last one, uh, lessons learned. So I think one of the big things that's coming to this, I was watching in the news the other day and they talked about, you know, I think Alberta was saying, you know, they've, the guys said they've actually had like zero cases of the flu this year. And these uh, pharmacies are stocked. They've got NyQuil coming out their ears. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, people haven't been getting colds and flus. Well, because we've been practicing some pretty good hygiene. So I think that's something to, get, to carry forward for sure. Um, the other one I think about is, you know, it was kind of nice early on with no deadlines, athletes taking time off when it was needed. That's still a pretty good plan. Um, obviously we introduced the element of competition as I've alluded to earlier. Um, yes, there's gonna be some stress in that planning, but I think um, that you know, there has been that good part. And I, and I think, again, maybe just underscores it for us and you know, really bold, bold ink is our athletes and our mental health is crucial to, to be healthy and be successful in training and in coaching. And we really have to pay attention to that. And our next one. And since we're going to race, uh, there will be a finish line. And um, we're not sure when, uh, but looking forward to, to seeing people racing and seeing results. And um, I'd like to thank you guys very much for coming here tonight. Thank you again to Athletics Alberta. And I hope um, you can take one little thing away from this. That would be great. And again, uh, look forward to your questions, but thank you. Well, thank you so, 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 so much. That was really, wow, that was a lot. Um, this is the most active, I think the chat has been <laughs> in, uh, in any of these sessions. So it's we'll usually me chatting, so that's unusual. Right, yeah, I don't even see lesson here yet. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go through um, a little bit here. <clears throat> Travis mentions uh, Michigan style workout to play with the anaerobic distances. Bill thought of that too. Uh, William Carver, when phasing in quality, what factors help you determine which direction to go, whether you start from short speed mm. and building up the distance or starting from distance and building in the speed? Actually, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of either or, because uh, I think, as I said, I think we need, we need to stay with, uh, again, or have that, that leg turnover in there at all points. I think we, we sort of get distance, distance people that, you know, that we don't run fast, so we just keep running and running, and it's always slow running. Um, I know that the runners would beg to, beg to differ, um, but I, I, think that, I, I think that you've got to, um, you've got to maybe look at your event. So I, I would say, for example, um, if I use an example, say of say Jessica running at you know 5,000 meters, I'm going to that anaerobic threshold is a bread, bed and bread and butter, sorry, of element of her event. So definitely that's where I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get down to that first of all, and then I'm going to go to, uh, I'm not going to really focus on getting into that kind of anaerobic tolerance kind of, you know, say repeat 400 kind of speed that's that's for example where we did the um the threshold mile with the three or, that's a lot of times three or four four hundreds in between and then alternating sets of those uh, you know at the end of one sort of sit back and say hey you know you just ran 12 four hundreds 
And that wasn't even the workout. The workout was also these other four miles. And the, four, and the, the 12 400s were pretty good quality. So, um, so I think I'd say, look at the event. I think from the, you know, the, the shorter event that I think probably then like the, your 800 runners that you probably want to be moving up those the 100, 200 ladder would, would be maybe a little bit more significant. But I do really think that that, that anaerobic threshold piece or that tempo piece, I think, I think that's, that should be a key part of, of any program of, you know, any middle distance and to distance program. It's, it's, a, it's, it can do so many useful things for you. Uh, we just have a comment here uh, from Becca, the timed intervals she found was one less thing mentally to worry about as an athlete who did these workouts firsthand in the oval, not having to worry about making certain time, a certain time during a workout I found, uh, or she found helped her feel less anxious. Um, Bill Corcoran uh, <laughs> throwing down some of the things that he was up to. Um, oh. I guess Peter Teagan calls this dynamic pace running from Travis Cummings. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. It really, this is so great. Mm -hmm. Lots of chat here going on. I like Doug's comment all from a bunch of introverted distance runners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hide behind the screen. Um, that's what. <laughs> do we have any more questions here before we wrap up for the evening? You're welcome to put them in the chat mm -hmm. or put your uh, microphone mm -hmm. on and and step right in. So my five minutes of everything I know is up, I guess. That's good. I think you have seven minutes left to answer <laughs> questions, right? Uh, Mr. Cummings uh, is wondering how to submit TT times to rankings. Oh, uh, I don't think that, oh, to everyone. See, that's not me. Um, it's an interesting, I, actually, if Travis doesn't mind, I'll speak to this because uh, what he's looking at is seeing if you could get an athlete into, um, you know, to a meet out in, Vancouver in, in June. And actually, I, I, Travis, I do have an answer for you from, uh, from Richard Lee, the beat director. And basically, I said, you're probably, you know, they, people are going to have to use time trials, because, you know, for a year and a half, people haven't really been able to race. So um, the one thing, the one comment that Richard made was maybe they could, you know, somebody um, had a videotape of it, for example, that would be a way of confirming it. If it was someone, I mean, somebody who's run a lot and has, you know, a background on the quality times, I'm sure they would, you know, if, if Gabrielle Stafford said, you know, I time trial 405, well, you take that, I'm pretty sure people would, they'd probably give her another 10 seconds off it. But if it was someone less known, I think that might be an idea. It's, you know, videotape it, send it along and say, here's, you know, and so and so just ran 445. Can they get into this? Uh, you know, there's, and I and I get the the challenge with this is because uh, there aren't going to be a whole lot of opportunities, so you don't you don't want to miss them if you can. Uh, and as an aside on that one too, for that particular event, um, it's the night of the Canadian 10,000 meter championships. In and there's right now on the list for the schedule is 10,000 meters and 1500. However. BC still has the, the rule of 50 people um, on site, including officials, including everybody. So uh, what he pointed out is if they've got a couple of fields for the 10K, they may not even have 1500. So a lot of these things are, I, I think we have to plan for them and train for them again, as if they're going to happen, uh, but be ready for a quick pivot at some point saying, hey, we're not going to get to do this. Um, I could use the example, uh, Melinda had put together a, a 10K race. She you know, for a number of reasons, wanted to race a 10K and a half marathon this spring and sort of made it happen herself. So got BC Athletics to, uh, to ratify it, got the officials, the timers, pace or whatever, um, went through all the COVID stuff. And it was in Abbotsford and the weekend they were supposed to go, big snowstorm through the past, so they didn't go. So she went the next weekend and three women got to run really, really fast, which was great. Uh, and now you know, in a couple of weeks, she's going to run a half marathon and they've got this thing set up in mission where they're running on a old speedway, 2.6 uh, kilometer lap track. And even there, I just mentioned to the guy, you know, I'm going to be coming through there and I'd like to watch. And he said, well, you know, to be honest with the number of people that are running that 10 Ks and the halves and the race walkers and officials and da, 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 and we can only have 50 people. You may not, you may not get in. Like you may be watching, I'll bring by binoculars. I don't know. Um, but so there's that, that reality where we just think, Hey, why not? We'll go do this. And we realize because of COVID, ah, we can't do that. Um, so again, that idea, I think planning for it, preparing for it, but being, um, being ready for a plan B, C, D, E, whatever the alphabet can take you to. 
Can I ask a question? You just did. <laughs> Can I ask another one? Yeah. Absolutely. You get, uh, these, you get these high school teachers on here. So you don't... Yeah, sorry. I, well, I get paid to talk, so I try not. Mm -hmm. to, I'm going to try to do less of it. But um, uh, I guess this is directed more towards the Executive Athletics Alberta. And I was... I don't uh, have it. Uh, and I was thinking of calling Christine about this later on tonight, but I'm here, so I'm just going to ask the question. Um, if we wanted, because I know that there is uh, hope that we'll have some sort of track season, but the likelihood it is probably not going to happen. So if we wanted to, um, that's just what I'm kind of planning for as a coach. So if we wanted to do some time trials during our practice track times, within our inter squads, how would we be able to actually submit that into Athletics Alberta rankings if that's actually all we have this year, just to kind of keep kids motivated and let them know who they're stacking up against? And like, would we need an official for that or videotape and submit? Like Mike suggested, I'm just trying to brainstorm ideas here just because I'm you know, starting to lay out a time trial series for my kids and I want to know what to tell them. Hi, Travis. I'll, uh, I'll field this one. Um, you know, we're working on essentially three plans for the outdoor season. Um, you know, the, the ideal world we would, you know, people are vaccinated in June and perhaps we can even open up things a lot more than we expect. So that, that's one thought. Um, we've been communicating with AHS this week about um, how to configure meets and, and what we can and cannot do. And and it's kind of a, you know, as we've experienced throughout the whole year, it's been a moving target a little bit, but I think um, we will have a path forward um, for every event group. And, uh, and um, you know, that may be what you just suggested where there's a training group and, and we get some officials to come out and we, we set up a kind of a mini type meet with you guys or whatever that may be. We're, we, we plan to, to give you guys every opportunity to, get results this summer. So um, we've already been in coordination with some of the officials with Irene and Louise just on how to do this. And so, um, you know, we're, we're preparing for some level of activation um, and, you know, essentially preparing three different scenarios on that front. So um, as time evolves here, you know, the comment we got from AHS today was quite positive in saying um, at this point they're thinking you know, kind of a bubble type scenario if we do uh, so, somewhat of a bigger meet. But the comment at the end was very much about, well, that's in the worst case scenario and the best case scenario is you might be able to do a lot more. <laughs> so so they gave us some answer, but not really. Um, but but uh, I do believe we will be able to do more um, than obviously we didn't do anything last year, but a lot more than maybe we expect. So we'll, we'll wait and see on that, but uh, we will have solutions for you. And and we will have solutions for uh, several event groups. So, <clears throat> any other questions coming up tonight? We're just about ready to wrap up. Thanks, Mike. Thank, thank you, Les. That's the longest Alison just has coached in a while. <laughs> about this really. It probably doubled your knowledge right there. <laughs> well, I have I have no knowledge, so it's easy to double. <laughs> this is a this is a preview of what the next session will be like when we get all four of these oh, guys you don't, together. I don't know whose idea that was, but it wasn't a good one. <laughs> Larry, Larry's, Larry's been my roommate a couple of times, so I got some stories. Awesome. Well, you, thanks, thanks a bunch, Mike. Uh, your presentation was uh, very detailed, very Thank informative, you. and uh, well, entertaining too. So uh, thanks for putting that together. Uh, the one thing that uh, the sprints, the jumps, the throws, and the distance all have in common when it comes to periodization isn't about planning from that meet and working backwards. All, what we all have in common is starting from today and moving forward. And the main thing is, too, is preventing the athletes from doing too much too soon. And as you said that's the coach's job because the athletes just want to get out there and do stuff so we need to do things safely smartly and be progressive about it so uh, that's the common theme with all of our event groups so yes it will be fun uh next week when we get all four of our speakers together on the the same show and uh yeah so if you guys have some questions in advance feel free to uh, shoot them our way and we'll present them to our speakers uh otherwise 
Uh, we're hoping, we're keeping our fingers and our toes crossed that tonight we will have a list of everybody who attended so that you won't have to send an email with your NCCP numbers. But uh, um, yeah, that, that's the plan and I'll match every, everybody up. But if you do have to, hopefully it's not a big burden that uh, just drop me an email with your uh, number and I can put it in because some of you might think like it's a real hassle to have to send you that number, but guess what? I get to do it a hundred times as I'm putting them into the system for you guys. So I'm happy to do so. I want you guys to get your point. And uh, like I said, hopefully you won't have to, but uh, just in case, be, be prepared for it. All right, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. So uh, thanks for coming tonight and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, week. Thank you, Carmen, Albert Athletics for doing this. Thank you. Thank See you guys you. next Thank week. You. Good night, everybody. Bye.